You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here talking with the members of the band The Fifth Circle. Their new single, The Intense Vibrations, is out now. You guys, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me, and welcome to The Pit. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Yes. I think for the sake of uh, our listeners knowing who you guys are and matching the voices to you, could you just go around and say your names and what you play in the band? Uh, I'm Dave Kesky. I play guitar and I do production. I'm Jordan. I do vocals and I write lyrics and uh, generally jump around and try and get people to dance. He likes the party. Yeah, I take my shirt <laughs> off and you know do that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, my name is Nikki. And I play the six string fretless bass. Um, I also take care of a lot of the booking uh, for my company, Solar Flare Entertainment. So at, for the first question that I have for you guys, it should be pretty obvious. It's just simply, who likes short shorts? <laughs> 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 we all do. How short are we talking, big boy? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> no, I, I, really, I like to start all my interviews with what I just the origin stories. Hollywood has gotten us all into people's origin stories lately. So, I, if, <laughs> if each of you, if you could go around, just say like how you got into playing your instrument and what maybe got you interested in the heavier, darker forms of music. Uh, so I started playing guitar, I guess, uh, around maybe 14. I didn't really take it seriously until I was about 16 or 17. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I've played music or been interested in music since like a very young age. I've, I've uh, even when learning like piano, I think I was like six or seven. My dad was trying to teach me piano. I wish I stuck with it. I didn't. Um, anybody listening, please stick with piano. It will literally teach you how to play any other instrument. Uh, it's, I can't emphasize that enough. And I got really into metal, I guess, the first time... Uh, I heard um, uh, Black Sabbath Paranoid on vinyl. I think it was 15. I, I came home. I turned, put on my my dad's uh, record player, and it was like, "What even is this? This is amazing!" Uh, and then kind of got into um, classic rock, Led Zeppelin, uh, Pink Floyd, etc., etc., etc. And then closer to um, like most death metal. I hated death metal when I first heard it. I thought it was the dumbest thing ever. And I couldn't get into it. And I was like this punk rock or die forever kind of kid. And then um, as I got older and older, uh, I started really appreciating it, appreciating it and, and realizing how, how, how deep the music actually can be and how much there is to it and how you can really, I mean, within, within one genre, there's, there's a million billion other genres and you, you really can do anything that your mind uh, lets you do within that genre. Um, and I just always, yeah, I've just been um, gravitated towards it since then. Yeah, I basically have the same origin story as Dave. I <laughs> did the same thing, took piano up until about grade three, then, you know, just lost interest or whatever. And, but then, again, at 13 years old, somebody played war picks for me. And I was <laughs> like, what the hell is this drumming? Because that was, that was the thing that really got me was the drumming in that song. Because it's, I mean, it's unlike most of the stuff I had heard up until that point. Uh, and like, it, it was so jazzy, but also really heavy at the same time. And it's just like, I don't, I don't know. I still love Black Sabbath to this day. They're probably one of the biggest influences on my musical taste and everything. But then, yeah, I mean, once you hit Black Sabbath, Jimi Hendrix, and Cannabis, and you combine all those together, I mean, it kind of just led me <laughs> down the path that I'm on today. And I, I started, like, um, I got into death metal probably a little earlier than Dave. I started singing it when I was, like, 16, just, like, at parties and just with my friends. And I, I would often just do it by myself in my car because, you know, that's what there was to do on that night, you know, and what else was I going to do? So, you know, channel towards something a little more productive and eventually, you know, start doing random songs here and there for people and then you know i didn't really get serious about joining a band until uh 
2011 when I met Dave. So there was a good period of like five or six years of where I wasn't really in a band, wasn't doing it that much, but I still try to stay practiced with like doing the death metal style vocals. So I, I always knew I wanted to start a band, but I just never was in the right place until that moment in time. And, yeah. And, you know, 10 years later now, pretty much, mm-hmm. uh, we're here today talking about our, it's like 23rd song or something like that that we've released. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a decent amount at this point. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, well, um, I was kind of like raised in kind of an, a pretty artistic family like pretty much like my entire family is in the arts like um so there's just like a lot of music kind of like always around me growing up and also where i grew in east where i grew up in east van there's just like so many sounds and different types of music around me so um i feel like i just kind of like i don't know just like picked up a guitar as a kid at some point and um you know our uncles were always giving us like the guitars to just like have around and Ultimately, I just started like skipping class in high school to go hang out in the music room. And the teacher, the music teacher at my school was like super cool. She was like pretend she didn't know that we were skipping class because she like wholeheartedly supported um, our musicianship. <laughs> so she would kind of just like, you know, she'd be like, yeah, I'm going to go print some stuff. I don't know you're here, right? Like, she's, like the coolest lady ever. Uh, turned out she liked metal too. Um, but yeah, I just kind of like, you know, my dad introduced me to a lot of the older blues stuff that metal evolved from and a lot of like the early thrash. And then, I don't know, my mom had kind of interesting music taste. She still listened to like Portishead, but like she would also like blast the eight mile soundtrack in the car. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it kind of like contributed to kind of, you know, I like, I have kind of, I guess, like a well rounded um, experience with music in general. And I just kind of picked up a six string fretless bass one day almost by chance and just got really into it after I'd been playing guitar for probably about 10 years at that point. So I've actually never even played a full string bass. I just jumped straight to six string fretless <laughs> and that's what I still do. And so now after you guys have gotten your influences and your origins, at some point you all found each other. So how do you guys remember the band beginning? Um, Oh boy. Um, <clears throat> the band beginning, I guess, um, kind of a long story. I, I, I want to say probably, yeah, maybe 2009, 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. I don't remember an exact date. Um, I, I had joined a band, uh, featuring a couple guys. Goliath. That, yeah. Goliath. We were called. <laughs> Um, before that, it had an even worse name. Stormcastle. Oh yeah, it was oof, <laughs> big big oof. Uh, Stormcastle. Yeah, Stormcastle. <laughs> yeah, don't ask. But um, yeah, so I met a guy named um, Mr. Black, Michael Black, crazy crazy little guy, um, literally very little on drums, he, um, who had a friend Marty, and we just jammed. I was playing bass at the time, <clears throat> and then um, things happened. Those two parted ways. They got into an argument at a bar. Yeah, <laughs> uh, as, as one does. And, uh, yeah, me and Mr. Black decided to keep going. Uh, Jordan worked with Mr. Black and recruited him in. And then, basically, from that point, we just had a revolving door of people coming and going until we kind of um, just had got some- Mike. Yeah. Well, yeah, until we had something going well enough to play shows with. And then uh, Mr. Black, the original drummer, left. We found a guy named Ramil, who is one of the best drummers I've ever heard or played with. And then from there, Jordan and I found Mike, who now plays guitar. And a couple of years after that, uh, we found Nick. It was like... 2016 and then we got Nikki and or Mike was 2015 something like that uh, maybe yeah something like that honestly like with with COVID like the last two years I I, I don't even count I, I like I don't even think about <laughs> like oh it was like a couple years ago like ooh like yeah six years yeah so Ramil would have joined in 2014 or like the something like that. summer and then Mike in the next year then Nagasad joined in uh, late 2017 18 2017 2018 20, yeah. 20, 2017 it was after the summer yeah. yeah i remember i remember meeting you guys it was like 
um, I was playing with another band. Um, and I think we were, we were on a gig together. And I think it was at the Waldorf. It was at the, either the Waldorf or the Seven Dining Lounge. And I remember I was like, oh, yeah, I, was on, I was on my way out of that band. I don't know. I was like having a bad day or whatever before my gig. And you guys offered me some whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember that. I was, yeah. The, the drummer of, of the band I was in was like driving me insane and like just giving me bad vibes. And I was just like basically hiding out in the green room. Like, oh, some whiskey. And then you guys, um, and then you guys told me you needed a bassist. <laughs> yeah. I specifically remember that show. That was fun. Yeah. I remember sitting it and it was the weirdest little venue. Uh, it was called seven dining lounge. Now it's something completely different. I think it's like a Korean, uh, Korean chicken takeaway place. Um, it, was, it, was, it wasn't really set up to play metal shows. It was just like it they, set up to do any shows. It was like a restaurant and would like, <laughs> it was so weird. And then, yeah, there was like, I remember they very specifically had this little dank green room in the basement and you had to walk through the kitchen to get down there. And then, yeah, I remember like the other band sitting down there and me and Mike were like, well, you guys want some whiskey? <laughs> and Nikki was there and that was kind of that. We played the show and then, uh, yeah, things happened with uh, our, our bass player at the time. And then uh, Nikki joined, she left her band. We had a spot open and then here we all are. And so now I need to know, where does the name come from? Where, how did you guys come up with this name, The Fifth Circle? And was there any sort of philosophy or concept behind the band? That came from our old, old guitar player who left around, I want to say 2013, 2014, Julian. Um, it's a guy. <laughs> yeah, it's a great guy. Hell of a guy. Uh, taken directly from Dante's Inferno, The Fifth Circle of Hell um i believe and i just read dante and i can't remember this off the top of my head the translation uh the fifth circle of hell i believe is is scorn or anger of some kind yeah it's a it's a section where uh the uh dante and his guide i guess virgil um uh, yeah the sorry the wanderer whatever it is whatever his yeah. name is okay when he goes down with uh, Virgil and then they cross the uh, river to Phlegius and then they try and get into the city and then there's an angel that comes and helps them and allows them into the city and that's the 10th canto so yeah it is that's the circle of anger or wrath yeah the all the uh, the circle for all the haters yeah uh, specifically wrath is, I'm yeah sure is what the know. wrathful yeah, people who wanted to do harm to other people, or, or... there's there's a scene where uh, they're crossing the river, and um, this figure rises up out of the uh, out of the river, and he confronts uh, the wanderer, and and he actually pushes, he just wishes him away, basically, and he faces a, and he ends up being torn apart by the sea of people in the the river, and like all this right. So, you know, Dante's full of imagery like that. So it's you kind of uh, draw from. I mean, there's yeah. a reason why we're still talking about it like 900 yeah. years after it's. Uh, yeah, it's very fitting, uh, very fitting name and description. And then um, so our the same the same guy, our old our old guitar player, he did like the uh, our, our symbol, you know, because um, we were trying to get some sort of emblem or symbol or something. And you know, like a five with a TH kind of didn't work. And we were kind of experimenting like uh, one of us, I can't remember who is like, oh, why don't we, you know, use the, the Roman numeral, the, the V, the VTH. And he drew it up and put it against a, a backdrop of uh, uh, the circle of fifths, like the, the musical, um, the, oh, I don't know how to describe the circle of fifths. If, if you know what that is, right. it's, yeah. So, and then, it, and we just looked at him like, that's it. That was it. And then um, when we originally went to put uh, all our music on Spotify, I'm guessing this is like 2016, 2017, turned out there's like 10 other bands <laughs> called The Fifth Circle, like either with the five or the F-I-F-T-H kind of thing. So uh, we just said, well, why don't we already use the existing thing we have, make the VTH circle, and then boom. So now when you look it up on online on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, even on a quick Google search, the fifth circle, nothing else comes up with the very first thing. Um, so it worked out. So, yeah, this is the important this goes to show you it's good to have an original name for a band name. 
Like it's really, so I, I think it's easy to cop out and just be like, Oh, I want to be eternal or something. But it's like, if you want to be, you know, like it's good to have an original name just for that simple fact that you show up first in the search bar. Like exactly. It's, very, it's a very pragmatic choice. I think that is sometimes is forgotten. And then uh, most importantly, we, we own the VTH circle.com. So that's our website and a lot of bands can't do that. And you know, so it's, it's a, it's a huge selling point. It, with the name, the fifth circle and the style of music that you guys play and with having incorporated six string fretless bass and with going up on stage, wearing the clothes that you wear and everything <laughs> like that. Is there any questions that you guys get asked a lot? Um, uh, I mean, in the beginning, maybe, I mean, uh, I, I don't even remember why. Oh, I remember, um, because Jordan would always go up on stage wearing short shorts and, um, or just not necessarily short shorts, just, you know, like ripped shorts and, and, uh, I, I think it was a dare or something like that. And, and Mike no, I, I, I did it just to kind of surprise people. <laughs> yeah. And then I don't remember exactly why it was a dare or something. And then our other guitar player, Mike, uh, just happened to fit into a pair of Nikki's, uh, jean shorts miraculously and uh they were skin tight and he rocked it and that was that (laughs) and then uh that was kind of it and then um i guess like the biggest question we got at first is like yeah kind of i guess like what are you doing i mean nobody really asked us about it i never thought about it i i don't do we get asked lots of questions i don't really know other than like Six set. Yeah. yeah, a couple a couple people asked me like why we always do that, and I was just kind of like, I don't really know. I mean, we just thought it'd be funny. And I remember also we had a conversation about like how I don't know men in bands should just like show off their legs and stuff more to get fans instead of making women do it all the time. Like I don't know. And then we kind of just all wear short shorts now. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, at the first it just became like a, a gender reversal thing, especially having you know like the token female or, or whatever. And then, um, you know, like a lot of, you see a lot of like metal bands or it doesn't have to be metal, but you see a lot of bands with females. And, and I, I don't know if it's, if it's by accident or if it's, you know, by label pressure or, or whatever it is, you know, like a lot of like the females in the band are sexualized or just, you know, made to look really, really pretty. And then, um, you know, like a lot of the press comes from that or, you know, like, I'm not saying all, but you know, it, it's definitely some bands do that. So, I mean, we always just thought like, well, let's just flip it. Let's just all the guys wear skimpy clothing. And then, um, Nikki just dresses regularly. Yeah. <laughs> but, I guess... but now I kind of, I don't know, I'm almost more comfortable with like showing skin on stage because the guys in my band do it too now. So it's almost like it, it all, I don't know, I guess it all works out anyway. But I mean, that was part of a, a problem that I had in past bands. Where, like, I literally got asked one time by the front man of a past band that, you know, that I should use, I can't remember how he worded it, but he was like, oh, you should use your femininity to promote the band more. Um, mind you, I was like 18 or 19 at the time. So that made me seriously uncomfortable, first of all. And then second of all, I was like, well, you know, you know, why don't the guys show off their bodies to get fun, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's... <sighs> I, I think actually now they think of it, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. People don't ask me anything. I get off stage. People just get out of my way. I don't know why, but like, I guess they, um, uh, Mike gets asked a lot specifically. It's like, Oh, you know, like, do, do, do you feel nervous going up on stage wearing next to nothing? And then we all look at each other as like, maybe at first, but now like I couldn't imagine going up there under the heat of the lights, rocking out, moving around wearing full pants you know what i mean like i i couldn't even imagine going back to that just because it's so practical <laughs> and so <laughs> so cool like i um yeah like we i remember we played a, a, a metal festival the last festival metal Apocalyptic, that we played i think it was 2019 um for whatever reason we put on pants and um <laughs> for whatever reason i I, I can't remember why i think we just it was like, oh, let's do something different or whatever and it was a, a festival in in the in the in the the interior of BC. It must have been like thirty seven 
between 37 and like 43 degrees in there and like immediately like what are we doing why do we do this to ourselves i guess the one question i would get asked is does your voice hurt after doing that and <laughs> But then, I mean, I, I can't really think of anything else than people ask us. I mean, it, it's the the shorty pants and uh, does your yeah. voice hurt? Every death metal singer gets asked that because, yeah. you know, those are people that don't listen to a lot of death metal that generally ask that because, you know, it's, at this point, it's a pretty well-known, like, vocal technique to be able to distort your voice in that way. And there's multiple yeah. ways to distort your voice. But, you know, that. Uh, I don't know if that'll ever seep into mainstream culture. It's getting there. But, you know. I get asked all kinds of weird questions as as a girl in a metal band. Um, I could probably go around about all the weird questions that I get asked. But I mean, definitely one of them is like, you know, oh, your your bass is so huge, like open up your hands, and it's like, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if I don't stretch, yeah, but like, you know, if it hurt, if it hurt that badly, I probably wouldn't play a six string bass. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, l- lots of weird questions, you know. Is it weird being a girl in a metal band? It's like not not really. <laughs> kind of feel like I'm a musician regardless of what's in my pants, but <laughs> I don't know. I want to know more about the writing process. How does this usually begin for you guys? Um usually specifically we, because we stand in a room and we yell at each other and throw riffs at each other until something works yeah. musically. Basically, and, uh, I guess you know, the, the easiest way I, I, all I was going to say, just because we are mainly like our, our music is guitar driven, usually it'll start with either Michael have a riff or I'll have a riff or Jordan will have a riff or an idea or a, a rhythmic idea or something. And then basically we'll just try to jam as many things as we can before or after it and just spitball and drink beer and scream and yell and cry and, and laugh until something sounds good. And then that's kind of it. And we just refine it and keep playing it until it sounds good to us. And then refine it until we're able to play it and blend it in the other songs we have. And then we just keep going. The, uh, the, I guess the last single was a little different because we had more distance writing and we did trade list riffs more online and mm-hmm. things like that. So there was that, but there's really, I mean, as far as we go as a band, we're very collaborative in the writing. There isn't like one main songwriter. Yeah. We've, which... we've, we've never written that way. And some bands can operate that way. That's just not the way we, we do it for whatever reason. It's, I, uh, yeah. I, I actually, I really like the uh, collaborative process too, because you could have an idea and when it goes through somebody else's machinery in their head, it turns out a little bit different. It's kind of like sending something through the wash and it'll come out a little different. You never, I, I, I like being able, like taking that risk with an idea mm-hmm. and letting somebody else to try and play with it and see, because sometimes you end up with stuff that you never thought could have happened. And it takes you places. Exactly. Yeah. Like I, I was, I, I was having this conversation with, um, with another interviewer yesterday because my other band is, is the exact opposite. Usually it's, it's, it's one uh, person brings in, in an idea. And while that's not a bad thing, uh, you get a lot more done a lot quicker. Um, there's all, there's the less, um, the less collaborative effort and the democratic process of songwriting is nothing short of, of absolutely frustrating. Sometimes it takes a while um, it goes back and forth seemingly endlessly, but in the end, yeah, it's, it's all, all the ideas that I bring in get changed. All the ideas somebody else brings in gets changed and morphed into something that's like very much us instead of me saying, okay, guys, here's a song, learn it or, you know, don't. And there's not one approach that works, but, um, the, the collaborative process is it, hard as it is. I feel a bit more rewarding. And when you guys think about the way that uh, the music sounded in the early days and the way you approached the writing, the music in the early days, as opposed to how it is now and how, how has it evolved? How have things changed for you? Um, we have a very much, uh, a, a way more skilled drummer. So we are able to write 
Well, our, our rhythm section is, is, it's definitely a lot tighter. It's nice having, well, Nagasa can play just about anything. So yeah, having her and Ramil be able to play together is like, it's really nice. It gives you, I mean, it's just a solid foundation to build on. Yeah. And, um, like the Mike has such a, like a different influence, a, a, a different way of playing guitar than I do. Um, so before a lot of it was, was Jordan and I, where Jordan would have a, like a kind of an idea and I would, I would kind of flesh it out. Um, and then, and write something around it right now, like Mike and I almost write completely opposite parts and then try to jam them all together. And, 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 um, having having the rhythm section having a, a talented bass player having a drummer that can like keep up and who drives us harder than we can play um i think really changed the game and also as far as like the artwork and lyrics go is like once naga said joined the band i was really able to delve into that side more before we didn't really have somebody who was a really good visual artist so, I mean, for that reason, below she was a great addition to the band, but I mean, she brings a lot of other stuff to the band as well as the booking and the bass playing and all that. Mm -hmm. So once, once she joined the band, we were, I think everything kind of came together as a whole because we were able to present, have a full musical package, but also visual as well. So any of our, just our pictures on Spotify or YouTube or any of our posts, like the, we have just better artwork because of it and yeah so yeah, like you need to be able to present yourself a, as well as just be able to play good music if you want to like make any sort of money in the music business so you, you need more than just to be able to play yeah unfortunately it's uh the the upside and the downside of of the music business the uh the music um while the most important almost always takes a backside to, to to all the other stuff that you would never think about you, like unfortunately like especially the way the business is now um <laughs> the music's almost an afterthought you, you give the music away to, to sell something else either merch or your live show specifically or, you know what i mean yeah definitely like I, I mean i'm the newest member so i can't comment too much on like i guess how it's evolved but like, at least for me i feel like especially in the past couple of years we've gotten a lot more refined with our overall artistic concepts for everything we put out like we have we definitely get together and we talk about more you know of like what what inspires us all for this one song or you know like we're working on an EP right now that we haven't started recording yet but we pretty much have the entire artistic concept down because we just talked about it and strategized how we're going to do it and I think that's again why the collaborative process is is really good because we all have our different inspirations and from and then and then when we combine that in a good way yeah it can make things a little like you know um take longer to come together but i think we get a really cool and unique product because of it and yeah with those mm -hmm. with those refined we all work together on i think that's uh that's the key word it's it's unique because it is all of us it's not just one songwriter and on your guys's last full album you you featured spoken word on the album, which I thought was really cool. I think a lot of bands kind of overlook using spoken word on the album and mixing in with the music. And I thought it was really effective. Do you guys think you'll ever do that again? Um, maybe something similar, but I, I like to take the approach that we can just try and do something new and evolve with every recording or, I mean, I'm definitely, uh, definitely open to the idea and it's a good way to convey um, pertinent information in a genre that is not known for clarity amongst its uh, vocals. So somebody's just listening to it as opposed to looking it up, looking at the lyrics as they're listening to it. Um, they, they'll be able to pick out more information. And it's kind of nice to be able to present that to people in, in a death metal album. And but, I, th I think also like along those lines too, it was um, because I was a concept record so those spoken word parts were absolutely necessary to to advance the story within the record um so saying like we're necessarily going to do it again or not do it again i think is totally subjective to what we're actually doing um because for example in our upcoming record we have um something else we've never done before like we have uh like a, like an interlude type song like a without you know 
talking it's an, to an instrumental. Yeah, we have an instrumental in between, you know, like all the death metal sandwiched in a song without giving too much away about the concept or anything like that, where we feature like an operatic singer with with uh, beautiful, like harmonized, clean vocals, uh, but not no lyrics, um, which we've never done before either. So, I mean, like, you know, saying we're going to return, who knows if we'll do that again either, right? So it's, it's, it's more about just evolving the ideas that we want to put in and the, the creative process, right? Yeah, just trying to make cool music. Yeah. I, I now I want to bring up Hallow Palooza. So how was how Hallow Palooza? <laughs> it was wild. It was pretty fun. Um, as the organizer, I'll admit I, I was very stressed out. <laughs> as organizers are. Just because of, you know, um, because I booked the show probably almost a year ago. So it was pretty much just a shot in the dark type, type thing. I just wanted to get a venue for Halloween because I was basically like, I knew I would be competing with other event organizers for a Halloween slot. Booked it on impulse and kind of just like crossed my fingers that the regulations would open up by then. And then they opened up, I think, like, like five days before the show. <laughs> capacity until then and i thought that like there was a possibility that everyone would have to be um seated and like there would be no dancing allowed and like the regulations regarding that were completely clear i know myself and several other promoters are getting a little frustrated with the wording of these things because it's kind of making it kind of hard for us to um, figure out what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. But um, yeah, it was a success. Uh, no COVID outbreak. Um, <laughs> we had nine bands on the bill. Um, so, you know, it was a really, really good time. Um, I don't know if you've seen pictures of our costumes, but um, <laughs> we looked pretty damn good. <laughs> I think, yeah, like more, more along those lines, I think where we really lucked out was not trying to do this at a, at a bar or a uh, licensed venue uh it was a little bit more underground it, it was still licensed it was still totally legal etc cetera, etc cetera. but we flew a little bit under the the pho radar um for the very specific reason that it's not a bar um so we got lucky and it's really frustrating i'm sure everybody has seen what's going on uh with the rickshaw in in town and, and live music and the absolute uh bullshit double standard between hockey games and some some huge country music festival being allowed to go on uh, side by side, a huge metal show, a huge sold out metal show getting shut down um, with half, not even half, like Roger Center. It was it was a hockey game is what like their capacity is twenty thousand, uh, no problem allowed to go on. I think a, a country show. I have no idea about the capacity, but you know, more than 800 or the 800 people that fit in the rickshaw. So, you know, like we got lucky, um, but we're in a sad state. It sucks. I, I still don't know why um, the Archfire show really got canceled. I don't, it's just not very, like we, we were checking vaccine proof and everything and um, yeah, we had no problems. Yeah. I was reading into actually on my, on my way here, the, uh, a lot of the art spire that the problem was because um the rickshaw the venue while while it is 75 percent seated because it's an old uh an old movie theater there's still the floor um <clears throat> where people stand and i from what i'm to understand is that the venue owner didn't have the requisite amount of folding chairs or um proper fixed chairs um, so they could have only operated at 80% anyways. And then at the same, and so, and they, they were contacted by the PHO just, or the, I, I don't know what the, the, the Bonnie Henry's people, they contacted her, contacted them and, uh, shut it down. Um, do you imagine folding chairs at an Arch Spire show? Oh, well, no, of course not. <laughs> I mean, that would be insane, but I mean, you know, like, okay, so. And, and what they tried to do, like, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows the story. I'm sure it's been disseminated 20 million times on, on, on social media. And it, it's, it's, it is what it is really. But, um, yeah, like, I don't, I don't know what, to, what else to say. It's, it's, it's beyond frustrating. I think the arts were definitely like not 
um, they were kind of left out of the equation when it came to a lot of these households. Yeah. You yeah, know. The, the arts and small businesses just aren't as important. As well, hockey is a multi-billion dollar industry. I, I'm not asking why. Um, it's still frustrating. Yeah, yeah, especially like, you know, we weren't allowed to have any shows at all. Okay, so this is okay. <laughs> yeah. I was just really frustrated last summer. I was really looking forward. I hope there was going to be the Armstrong Metal Festival and then... That got canceled, oh, yeah. but you know, just a ways away in Calgary, the stampede was still going on in the same month. So it's like I understand why people get frustrated and confused. And well, and to be fair, on that exact same line, um, uh, loud as hell went on yeah, as an, as an open right. air festival. However, that's delving into the politics of of Alberta land. That's right. you know what I yeah. mean, exactly. And 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 Armstrong is not Calgary or Edmonton, no. and so no. and <laughs> and it is indoors. The, the Armstrong one? Yeah, so yeah. It, it, it's a camping festival, but it's held within like an arena. Oh. Yeah, like the bands play in, yeah, it's like a gymnasium type Yeah, thing. Hazard Arena. Well, see, that's why I was so excited to go, as I hadn't been yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really good time. It was so fun. We, we yeah, played a couple highly of years recommend. Ago. I think 2019 we played? Yep. Yeah, that was yeah. awesome. That was a great time. Now, what do you guys see on the horizon for yourselves? This EP that you're working on, is is, is it all kind of like guns blazing on that? Um, yeah, I mean, um, the majority of the music has been written. There's a lot of ironing out to do and, and finalizing. Um, uh, Mike and Ramil and I spent a lot of the, uh, the uh, pandemic, because we're all unemployed, um, hashing out five new songs so we're in the process of finalizing that and we're going to begin recording that and then yeah the, if nikki wants to talk about the the video idea oh yeah um well yeah yeah as dave said um there's a couple we kind of got to finish up and you know really just nail down a recording and then um essentially um so it's a five song ep well too much of it but we're basically, um, the plan is to make a video for each song, um, and it's all going to cut together into probably about a half hour long short film based on uh, the five stages of grief um, with a lot of references to Dante's Inferno, but it'll be more like in an urban setting. Um, so it's pretty cool. It'll be like kind of kind of a big project, but it's it's super exciting for sure. To bring Dante's Inferno full circle once again. <laughs> yeah. From the beginning of the interview. Um, yeah, and it's nice to actually write something, too, that's got some room to add Dante's Inferno in it, because I've actually been waiting for, like, the appropriate moment for this since we named the band the Fifth Circle. So this is this should be a good release for us. We're, we're trying to do something ambitious, and, you know... So yeah, you got to take our artistic risks to uh, succeed. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to hear it. So uh, any any idea when it m might come out in the future? Any guesses? Um, realistically, like Nikki said, we, uh, we're still ironing it out. Um, un unfortunately, due to logistics and, and uh, COVID, uh, our We've been all in different places. Our uh, our drummer, mainly due to his job, uh, was not able to jam with us on a regular basis at all uh, until I think like June or July or something like that. Um, so we're really playing catch up big time in that regards. Uh, we're trying to finish a couple songs. Uh, we have basically half of half the music uh, fully written. We have one song, like the song I was talking about before, uh, mostly recorded. And then uh, we have to basically get all the death metal parts recorded. I'm guessing we're going to start uh, in the new year at some point. Um, we'll see. It would be, I would like to say 2022, but it might be like early 2023. I think it would be 2023. I'm yeah. leaning towards that. Um, yeah. It's going to be a pretty immersive project. And it's gonna take quite a bit of time. Um, how and money it will, <laughs> and money that just goes hand in hand. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's gonna be a large uh, 
a large time investment. This is a staple question that I always ask people, and it's it's a corny question, but I still like to ask it. What advice would you guys give to anyone who's just trying to achieve their dreams? In in like in general? In general. Oh man. That's Dream cool. big, set attainable goals, and never give up never settle for something that's not what you want yet uh, unless it's a waste of time you got to know when to give up on some things too uh, yeah well I, I, think I that's what i mean by set attainable goals yeah, have a dream yeah. set an attainable goal and work as hard as you can towards it and don't accept anything less than what you are happy with and in the most big general sense yeah i don't know i i always say um it's very cliche, but follow your heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my old chef used to say. Chef, is this cook or chef? What should I do with this? Follow your heart. Follow your heart. I, I think there's. I think I don't know. It's very true for a lot of things, and I don't know. It's a recurring theme for me. Like, um, I, I feel like in this industry, in entertainment industry in general, I've been doing so. Um, I find that like it's you get tested so much entertainment in general because you know you have to engage with an audience but you also have to take care of your own life and you gotta you know you have to make compromises and you got to make decisions that are really difficult just um stay true to yourself and to always do what you feel is right and i mean yeah to elaborate on the knowing when to give up i think you can't fully control you can only control to an extent and i think it's very good to like be able to just let go of it when something doesn't go expect it to or, you know, to every detail that you want it to, but knowing when to just let go of that, it's going to go the way it goes and I'm going to do my best. Yeah. When you talk about achieving dreams, it always makes me think of the Aesop rock song, No Regrets. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's listened to that. You three? May, I have no idea. I was saying that was one Aesop rock, rock song off the top of my head. I really like, I can't remember the name of it. But, but anyways, this the, it's a great song, but the, the line is... Uh, when the they're asking Lucy, the, the one of the characters in the song, about you know her her dreams at the end of her life, she said, "Look, I've never had a dream in life, a dream in my life, because a dream is what you want to do, but still haven't pursued. I knew what I wanted and did it till it was done. So I've been the dream that I wanted to be since day good, one. Right? So yeah, Aesop Rock is a uh, he's a great lyricist. Is there anything else that you guys would like to say to our listeners? Um, I guess other than check out our new single and our new, um, our awesome new lyric video, it's on our YouTube, um, all our social media. If you go to facebook.com slash the fifth circle, there's a ton of links, uh, Spotify, the fifth circle, uh, the intense vibration single, give it a listen now. Uh, let us know what you think. Even if you hate it, let us know how bad you hate it. Um, you can go listen. to yeah you can go to the fifth circle.com too to just get any go to all of the same links everything's up there especially if you hate it just 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 tell us how bad you hate it and then tell all your friends how bad it is so they can listen to it too <laughs> yeah because haters give you publicity now that's how it works <laughs> I, if there's one last thing i could say i think sex work should be decriminalized in canada but that's a political statement. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is um, we have a funny version of the music video also coming out. Uh, probably yes, I forgot about that. In the next few weeks, um, because I don't know, I felt like the subject matter of the song was so like intense and very focused on global issues that like, um, I'm going to tell a short story here that's pretty funny if we have a minute, but um, yeah. we, so we were, I was like, okay, so I basically do a storyboard for this absolutely ridiculous, like, very DIY, like campy video, because I just wanted to make something funny, like for our fans, because, you know, especially with COVID and all the other, you know, dark kind of, you know, awful things going on in the world and the subject matter of the song, I was like, let's just make a hilarious, like stupid, ridiculous video. And then basically what happened was we had the song, it was done being mastered and we wanted to send it out for a PR run. And the PR guy, <laughs> I don't want to say he hated it, but he basically said that it was like too silly to like promote. Yeah. Nobody so we went back it. and we were like, okay, like we'll make we'll make like a series lyric video for the PR run, but I mean we're still gonna put out the funny one just like on our own accord. But um <laughs> but it's really funny. I think it's I think it turned out well. 
Um, Jordan and I edited it ourselves. We got a friend Sienna to videotape it, and our, we put our friend Sylvain in a bear suit. It's it's pretty great. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing that. <laughs> It's yeah, a good time. So, yeah. Yeah. So that'll be on our YouTube. Um, oh yeah, follow us on TikTok as well. Um, we're we're trying. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to The Peach Pit. I've been here talking with the members of the band The Fifth Circle. Their new single, The Intense Vibrations, is out now. You guys, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me, and hopefully we'll do it again in the future. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so, so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's been great.